Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone. I am Shreya Agrawal and you are watching a session on the theme Unlocking Innovation Manufacturing and Supply Chain. Before we deep dive into discussion with this extremely meaningful panel, let's do some context setting on the same. One of the most important question on the minds of business people when it comes to the impact of the COVID-19, it really has been that how can innovation be continuously unlocked in manufacturing and the supply chain management? The supply shock started last year in China, and as the global economy shut down for the spread of the virus, the vulnerabilities in supply chain production strategies began to get exposed. A myriad of geopolitical issues began to crop up. As well, all of this has led to manufacturers worldwide having to deal with major competitive pressure to augment their domestic production, increase rate of employment, and cut down on their reliance on unstable sources. The new goal for these manufacturers worldwide was figuring out how to have agile manufacturing strategies and make do with what's left of their global supply chains. The issue before the pandemic are probably going to stay the same. In such a high pressure environment, enterprises would feel the need to charge more, but they would not be able to because consumers wouldn't be able to pay as much at a time like this, and there would be an unrelenting need to operate optimally and frugally use up manufacturing capacity and capital. If you look at the studies now, when disruption hits, companies that invest in innovation outperform the market by up to 30%, which is why today's most innovative organizations are working towards connecting product lifecycle management, supply chain, manufacturing processes, and data in the cloud. Enterprises can unlock more value by aligning all processes and data on one platform like an integrated suite of enterprise cloud applications. Whatever long-standing vulnerabilities and risks were lurking in the supply chain of companies, they were exposed during this outbreak. Organizations had to redefine their DNA and understand what could be done to improve their business model and processes. This pandemic has opened the doors for potential growth and innovation and demonstrated that there could be digital supply networks to anticipate unforeseen changes and minimize the impacts of unexpected changes. Today's technological solutions aim to support the entire innovation life cycle from capturing a high value idea to developing, planning, manufacturing, and maintaining products and services. There has been a breakthrough in how data is leveraged and analyzed from connected devices, products, factories, and customer feedback to provide the velocity needed for continuous product, business service, business model innovation. The biggest challenge, however, for organizations today is to rethink how to make their supply chains durable without weakening their competitiveness. To meet that challenge, it is extremely important that they should first understand their vulnerabilities. With advanced technology solutions in play, how can innovation actually be sustained to manage interconnectivity when adverse impacts occur? What could supply networks look like post the pandemic? To break it all down, please help me welcome a very obvious panel today. CS Singh, CTO, UNO Minda Group, Sushil Rati, CEO of Mindra Logistics, VR Sharma, Managing Director, General Steel and Power, and Manish Kelkar, Director, SCM and ERP Competency, Oracle India. As you can see, we have a very, very meaningful panel here. We have business leaders who can give us on the ground ideas and insights as to what they are seeing. And we also have one of the largest company, technology company solution providers to tell us on what really is he seeing when he talks to these business leaders. I would have liked to begin with you, Mr. Sharma, from a general steel and power perspective, a pretty large organization. And my first question to you really is that if I were to ask you over the last 18 months, how has your business undergone a change? What do you think are the key challenges to come to the fore? And do you really feel that there's a new set of expectations from your customers? So thank you. Thank you very much for calling me. Last 18 months, or I would say uh, the post uh, pandemic or the COVID-19 first wave, uh, when government of India declared lockdown in the March, uh, March 2020, uh, most of the things have changed. We have learned a lot uh, from this pandemic, or I would say the conditions compelled us to learn uh, a different life. So now we know that how to uh, manage, how to uh, go with the flow, and uh, how to manage the business. Right from work from home to the deliveries, 
from the transportation logistic issues to the port issues, we have faced a lot of many problems. Fortunately, we in General Steel, we did not close uh, our companies. We kept on working during lockdown also. 22nd March, the lockdown was declared by Government of India. 24th March, it was declared that steel is an essential commodity and the steel mills and its suppliers or vendors can continue. So that was a blessing to us, I would say. We could uh, we could trace that who are the which are the countries and who are the customers, those who can buy our products. Up till that time, we were not very much aggressive in exports. But uh, this particular uh, COVID situation and lockdown, when out of 7.8 billion people, 4 billion people were sitting at home. So it was also a little hard to find out uh, uh, the customers. But somehow we uh, got to know that uh, the COVID-19 situation is receding in Western Europe because uh, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, France, Germany, they had seen the peak in the month of uh, February and March. And uh, similarly in Southeast Asian countries, it was receding. So we started supplying, we started exporting uh, to these nations and we did our highest exports, our highest uh, production. We could also make our highest EBITDA level in terms of profitability. So that was a very different situation. And we continued this journey for the quarter two, that was uh, August, September, October, then again, quarter three, and also quarter four. So during this pandemic year, uh, JSPL, I would say, maybe the uh, entire steel industry, but JSPL has recorded uh, our highest production, our highest profits, and uh, we won the losses uh, in the in the year 2019-20, and uh, we did a bumper profit. Our net profit was 7,500 crores after taxes, and we had an EBITDA of about uh, 14,000 crores. So for us, the business was, uh, I would say, better. Uh, unfortunately, it was COVID, but uh, business was good. The challenges what we faced is uh, shipping, transportation, uh, the, the, the logistics, uh, the surface transport basically, but uh, Indian Railway was very helpful and they could bring, bring our material back from ports to ports and mines to plants and uh, again from plants to ports. So the Port Authority of India, they were very cooperative they kept the ports open despite of uh, COVID situation in the country and ports being uh, treated as, a, as an international, uh, international asset. So that's why all the ports were open. And finally, we could export the material to different destinations. So from Europe to Middle East and then Southeast Asia, we could do much better exports and we didn't stop. Uh, we have done... Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that, and uh, thanks for sort of laying out the lay of the land for us on how we converted challenges into opportunities. Like you mentioned, that you recorded some of the highest revenue numbers and also profits, and extremely a bit of positive in that uh, in that time frame. I want to sort of understand and perhaps come down to you now, Sushi, from the logistics perspective. Uh, all of this that we are talking right now on technology solution for businesses has to be spoken in the context of time and space. We are at an environment where risk has assumed a different meaning altogether. The meaning of risk perhaps has changed for business leaders. One does not really know what is the meaning of risk in a world which is assuming to be so uncertain with every passing day. It does not necessarily seem to end. At a time when touch was taboo, my question to you really is that what has that really meant for a logistics company? Touch being taboo, what was the biggest bottleneck in scaling your business? And do you really feel that the traditional business applications have been able to resolve those challenges? Because if there's two words which we heard the most in the COVID-19, it was digital transformation. So one was the challenge that you faced. And the other, do you think traditional business applications were able to solve those challenges for you? Thank you. So let me try and break it into two parts. One is uh, in the year 2020, uh, when the COVID uh, was in its full uh, blow and uh, you know we had the situation where there were different 
part of the country went into lockdown uh, there was of course a country wide lockdown also so one was that period and secondly coming out of that maybe coming out of the you know first wave and then uh, post the second wave etc and what were the differences uh, between the two so in the initial stages the biggest challenge for us was to ensure that the uh, the trucks which were en route how do we manage to make them reach at the uh, you know the customer destination safety of goods safety of uh, our uh, uh, trucking partners drivers and ensuring that all the essential uh, supplies are uh, you know taken care of through our warehouses and transportation business uh, especially as you are aware the consumer uh, goods and the e-commerce operations were open even during the uh, the lockdown period so we had to ensure the safety of our employees who are working in the front line and uh, you know they need to work uh, e- even more uh, during these time to ensure that the at every home we can make this thing reach and you would have all observed that during that time as as you rightly mentioned touch was the taboo so more and more online uh, you know ordering was happening and we had to also ensure that by taking all safety precautions we deliver those goods uh, at the uh, desired time uh, and at the desired place so those were some of the challenges which we uh, you know encountered on top of that uh, the international supply chains were also completely broken you had the situation where the uh, passenger aircrafts were all stopped so whatever could go into their belly space that material could not be shipped the supplies were also getting diverted to covid related supplies so all other goods were uh, by we, we were not able to you know uh, see the uh, availability of space same was the uh, situation with the shipping line etc so the situation was very very chaotic and one had to manage during this time keeping the safety of employees uh, into consideration and that is where our major focus was in the initial uh, few months uh, let uh, let's say 3 to 4 months post that as the business uh, activity started picking up as more and more uh, you know opening up started happening uh, we had to plan uh, completely in a different way uh, the whole supply chain along with our customers so for me the most important aspect at that time was planning of the uh, the uh, entire supply chain along with our customer and there had to be much more collaborative effort at that juncture to you know ensure that the uh, customers are also supported well at that point of time and we are able to add value to their uh, issues and challenges at that point of time today after almost a year uh, i can say that uh, you, you know we have come beyond even pre covid level our business volumes are much higher than that but it is also because uh, a lot of companies now are looking at uh, more established players to manage their supply chain because they would like to see two three things one is a better planning for which there is a collaborative effort is required then second they are looking for integrated solutions and that is not everybody's cup of tea so you you need a warehousing or distribution solution which a single party can provide and third investment in technology is very very important to understand the technology is going to play a very big role going forward in the modernization of your supply chain and that is where uh, you know the companies like uh, mahindra logistics play a very important role because they can make a huge investment uh, in the technology which is which was any which way uh, an ongoing thing but got a boost during this uh, covid times thanks for that mr rati and so the very well put that the businesses are increasingly looking to work with large reputed organizations because number one is more preparedness second they want people who can serve the single point solution having large warehouses and third like you mentioned and hit the nail with it that technology is transforming supply chain and companies want to partner with those organizations which are 
doing this. Uh, these are meaningful insights coming to the fore. I want to sort of bring you in now, CS Singh, before I get on to uh, my niche from a technology perspective. The same question for you. I mean, we heard both Mr. Sharma and Mr. Rati sort of beautifully explaining to us the lay of the land and how they converted those challenges into once in their lifetime opportunities for them and what lessons they learned. What really were your bottlenecks? And what are the lessons learned in this time frame? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this uh, question. I think uh, as a Uno Minda group, uh, when it comes to scaling our business, I think uh, we are growing good. And we have already a uh, proactive approach in considering long-term business planning where it takes care of such a dynamic situation. However, in the pandemic time, due to a lot of complexity in the supply chain due to the global linkages in our manufacturing and supply chain management, it was clearly evident and it is exposed that the high import contents, especially in semiconductor, engineering plastic, a new technology, child parts, which is mainly coming from China and some other part of the world. Due to that, it is failed. And also you can see in the current scenario, many of our OEMs are not able to produce the numbers what they really need to produce because of this uh, challenge. So scaling of business in terms of uh, this uh, constants, we have uh, in general big challenge. Secondly, we are also not able to, let's say, uh, as in general in the industry, due to China and global competition, and there are many supply chain restrictions and political constants, which has definitely got exposed during this pandemic time, that you are not able to enter into the global supply chain other than being more focused on the domestic market so that is another you know uh, areas where you know it is a challenge and it is also an opportunity for indian market indian businessman to really look into how to scaling up the business in the overseas market most another important factor also got exposed that uh, OEMs and maybe the mainly tier one, which is, uh, you know, main into the more close coordination. But the tier two and tier three has been always disconnected and they are not keeping eye on the future and these challenges. They were more dependent on the tier one and you know, the OEMs. So the complete ecosystem integration also has created, uh, or I would say it has got exposed that if you want to scaling up the business after pandemic or if you have a high volume demand these two elements two and three is not in line with your you know, expectations neither they have such infrastructure thanks Another for that more, yeah you want to go on you want to continue yeah yeah so another most important thing also i would like to highlight here is that uh, we do not have a dynamic uh, roadmap in terms of the supply chain, in terms of the manufacturing roadmap integration, which is very, very necessary in the current scenario of automation, digitization and adoption of industry four, where basically you can uh, you know, be in the dynamic situation of uh, increasing your the volumes, taking care of the global scenario in the supply chain management. So the digital infrastructure also was one of the big bottleneck, I would say, and it has really uh, created a lot of troubles to the numbers which we wanted to produce in Indian market. So these are the, you know, more uh, important uh, factors, which is, you know, creating problems for the scaling of our businesses in, uh, you know, the Thanks Indian and industrial market. Thanks for that. You spoke about quite a few things, you spoke about the fact that industry 4.2 and perhaps the digital infrastructure is not necessarily prepared for this. And also some very important insight in terms of how tier two and tier three has to go into the fold if you want to scale up. I come to you now, Manish. You heard all your business leaders who perhaps could be your potential people whom you work with or you have worked with in the past. And there are many more I'm sure you work with. If you were to give me some of the similar sounding noises or similar sounding concerns that came to your fore, what were really those in terms of use cases, which, which you can perhaps tell us more 
and how technology could really solve for them. So it is interesting that we have some couple of senior folks from the steel industry who have joined us today. And just uh, uh, just a couple of weeks back, I was having some interesting conversations uh, with some very large steel houses. And uh, I will give that perspective later in the conversation. In terms of the question that you're asking, and uh, uh, on the lighter side, innovation seems to be the new norm today, and uh, more specifically supply chain. Uh, see any politician, uh, supply chain is a freely used word today when it was unknown, possibly a couple of years back. And uh, I was listening to some conversations from some global leaders and absolutely supply chain will be at the heart of it. And uh, uh, we in Oracle uh, servicing so many global customers are privy to the change or upheaval that is happening in this industry. And I will give you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, when this situation hit us 18 months back, and I many a times try to avoid the word pandemic, when this situation hit us, a uh, few things which we did not use frequently became the new necessity for us. For example, a small little bottle of sanitizer, which we never ever encountered in our life. And today I have a bottle in each and every uh, room of my home or indeed in the office. So uh, organizations like Unilever or Record Bankizer, who are our big customers, came to us and said, OK, we have the capacity which is limited. I can't build manufacturing plants overnight to service this industry. How can we redo our uh, planning activities so that we scale down on the products which are not needed in this situation, but scale up on the soaps and personal hygiene products that are absolutely vital for survival? And that's where our uh, uh, difficulty started in Oracle. Uh, if they were sh shipping X million amounts of units a month, that quantity came to, came to us within a week. And we had uh, solutions like our transportation management solution, which effectively helped them dispatch the goods in the time that the SLAs were agreed to with their end customers. Uh, 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 there is a case study which our customers have today published that their throughput, incidentally, Srija, you'll be surprised, increased more than 100% of their capacity in these times in terms of the products that they serviced or uh, let out to the market. Another wow. important thing, I will take only a minute. It is very crucial. Uh, how has innovation helped us? And I will give you an example because I'm doing this for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, take any uh, medicine that unfortunately some of us use or don't use, the average time to develop a molecule, as we call it uh, technically, and which you call it a pill or a vial or injection that you take, is between six to seven years. Imagine organizations had to reduce that cycle using innovation to bring it to 11 months. So the first uh, dose that uh, was available in the market took only 11 months. So from seven years, we got down the innovation cycle to 11 months while still maintaining the quality. And that is remarkable, never seen in the past. Srija? Absolutely, you're absolutely correct. I mean, the innovation life cycle time horizons got considerably reduced and very rightly so because we had such an unprecedented challenge at hand for us. Uh, thanks for sort of laying that out for us, uh, Manish, and some very useful examples that you brought to the fore. I really like this insight that, you know, how FMCGs had to come to you and you had to plan for them on how to scale down things not needed and scale up things which require immediate attention. Uh, I think we are at the middle of a conversation where, as all of you put it, the supply chain is really at the heart of it. All business leaders in their board rooms are discussing this. All of you spoke a lot about perhaps domestic supply chain. Let's spend some bit of time talking about the international linkages and the global supply chain. It was the first time when the COVID-19 really exposed solidarity within countries. Globalization became a bad word. We actually went into a scenario where we are entering into globalization, for instance. I want to start with you, Mr. Sharma, and then go to other panelists also. What does it really mean to be a global company now when you have global linkages? It's much more of a headache one can understand. And can technology really solve for it? 
So uh, technology plays a vital role, and especially when we speak uh, any digital technology. Uh, you know, we have been facing problems, especially for the inward cargoes coming from Australia and also from uh, uh, Venezuela and Colombia. And uh, most of the vessels, they were stuck up in the high sea, sometimes due to the crisscross movement uh, in Indian Ocean. And uh, because most of the ports, they were uh, they were uh, scared that if uh, this COVID-19, uh, it is spreaded by the crew, which is in the on the on the vessel. So that will be a disaster. So that was taking 14 to 20 days quarantine time. The vessels were waiting on different ports when they were going for the refueling or uh, they were going for the uh, crew change. So that was a big challenge. And, you know, we used to ask the vessel owners. We, we, we used to see through radar where the vessels are, when the vessels are going to reach. And it was uh, most of the time it was a touch and go story that, yes, we were exhausting our uh, uh, our uh, inputs, or you can say the raw materials, especially the coking coal and some of the specialty materials like refractories. And uh, all of a sudden, we find that yes, the vessel is coming to the east coast of India. So, you know, that was a very big challenge. And uh, yes, of course, uh, the, uh, the entire uh, digital platform that has helped us, like anything. And uh, but finally, what happened? The, 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 sea freight that started increasing and from a, a damage level of about 10 to 12 thousand dollars a day it reached to as high as 80 thousand dollars a day then you know each minute was very important whether it is the load port or it is on the discharge port and this is where we took the help of our uh, our it specialists we took the help of our uh, logistic people that we could manage we, we took the help of uh, port authorities so that we can avoid or minimize the uh, damages part. Because uh, uh, if one vessel is waiting at a berth and the, my vessel is standing outside, so I know I was knowing that $80,000 or $60,000 or whatever we agreed with the uh, vessel owner that is uh, going to be paid on daily basis. So there was wow. a big challenge. So this is what uh, you know uh, happened. And yes, of course, the, uh, the IT, the, the digital transformation, uh, though we had been doing it for long, but we reactivated it in a great pace during this time. So that has taught us so many things. Yeah, so technology clearly got into its own and where the cost was so high, you just mentioned like $80,000 and you're a time bomb kicking. You were seeing every minute how much you can have to spend and technology came to its rescue. So what we were talking about, and if I would take your word, what you mentioned, revitalizing it. So it's actually about rethinking the entire supply chain that we are talking about. And that brings me to the next question. I want to sort of get on to you now, Sushree. What are the key components, if you were to tell me, CTO of a large logistics company, we talk about something as significant as rethinking supply chain. If you were to give me, Shreeja, these are the three or four key constituents for it. What would those really be? And how did you think through that? So Shrija, uh, let's talk about the uh, you know challenges and how uh, best you know we could have uh, overcome some of these challenges, etc. So Mr. Sharma talked about uh, international supply chain issues, uh, whether it was ocean freight or whether it was air freight, etc. So at this juncture, it was very very important that we uh, you know look at the innovative solution as well as take the help of uh, technology, especially for analytics part, to see what is the alternative which we can present to our customer. So for example, uh, I, you know, uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier also, the passenger flights uh, not being available put a lot of strain in terms of the capacity uh, which was available for air freight, etc. And the rates also have gone through the sky high and, uh, you know, almost like five to six times compared to the pre-COVID uh, scenario. And in this situation, obviously the supply chain cost for each of my customer has gone up uh, on which uh, nobody had a control. But within that, uh, how did we innovate? Uh, what is it that we tried to do? So we started looking at the patterns of the demand of our customers from different countries. And we try to make a sense out of their uh, overall demand pattern and say that, uh, can we consolidate some of these things? And instead of bringing as a, you know, small packets or a small consignment, etc., can we consolidate and do a charter flights, etc.? 
which will bring down the cost it will also help in terms of bringing the material much faster and so so we had to work with multiple customers uh, we uh, uh, had to get into their planning cycle to understand uh, because uh, it, it was not only about simple consolidation but when they place the order at their uh, suppliers in let's say a uh, china or uh, taiwan or any other location and how do we ensure that we can consolidate uh, looking into their uh, cycle so it was a very collaborative effort with our customer so so the the key thing here for me is during these times it was very very imperative that we collaborate at the planning level itself and there the uh, processes looking at the processes between the customer and us as well as the help taking the help of the technology in terms of uh, doing the analysis finding the various mechanism through which we can you know then do the consolidation etc was one of the key aspect coming to the domestic front you know again uh, the transportation rates have gone up uh, not only because of the diesel hike etc but because of the lop sided demand and supply so for example you will have from one location uh, you know trucks going but on the other side they are coming empty how do we uh, forecast uh, availability of a truck at a particular location match it with the demand in that particular location and then try to fill that capacity so that the overall cost can be optimized how do we optimize the load itself which is going in a truck while a lot of my customers said that they would like to send a full truck but when we do the analysis we find that against a capacity of say a 10 ton truck probably on an average only 5 ton or 6 ton load is going or at the distribution level we saw that very small uh, numbers are going on a daily basis and that is where again we got back to our customers work with their planning cycle advise them guided them in terms of how do we consolidate so that eventually you can optimize your supply chain cost otherwise on an average i think each customer has seen that their supply chain cost during this pandemic had gone up and only with this better planning better collaboration we have been actually doing the other way around we have been able to reduce the cost for our customers and that is where i would say one of the biggest learning for maybe uh, you know us as well as for our customer is to open up be transparent and work in a very collaborative manner because then as a specialist we can advise them how do they manage their supply chain and how do they optimize their supply chain cost thanks for that mr rati you answered my questions that are pretty beautifully that you have to collaborate from the planning stage itself you have to plan properly you have to you have the ability to work fast and all of this would not only lead you to better manage and innovate but perhaps reduce your cost for your customers and for yourself so our both institutions got out such meaningful insights and planning insights I want to sort of get on to you uh, thing, and you spoke about in the first question about the challenges, and you heard both your colleagues, uh, business leaders, sort of talk about you know how they use technology to their advantage, either to bring down the cost or perhaps bring the supply chain, how thinking in the organization. My question to you really is that uh, Manish also spoke about this entire idea of integrated suite of applications. what has that really meant as a solution in perspective for your organization so yeah i think uh, it's very well explained uh, what i am seeing today one new word i just discovered while listening so order to delivery is the new norm so like in digital infrastructure if you look at amazon or any other you know the digital platform where the buyer and seller is connected directly i think this ecosystem is completely missing into the other than in you know, the consumer product area especially in automotive and you know the non automotive sector heavy industries so digital infrastructure and automation is the key today starting from order to delivery has to be automated and there has to be a human free planning so that there is no gap into the entire supply chain and ecosystems there has been a communication gap 
if you look that the way we got exposed to, to semiconductor industry not connected and nobody was knowing from where who is buying what kind of materials in fact there was a tier 5 6 discovery also you know during this pandemic time so we always used tier 1 2 maximum 3 but we discovered 5 6 uh, linkages the original inputs for the semiconductor industry were somewhere else in the world so the order to supply has to be digitized and there has to be a very good tracking to the buyer that how is my order now where it is being you know uh, manufactured this kind of you know the digitization is must and i really see uh, the beautiful uh, you know the future the bright future if innovative people those who are developing innovative products i am from the r and d side that's why i'm using this word and it is well supported by innovative digitally in enabled infrastructure which is local so we long back started the self finance activities other than technology roadmap and manufacturing roadmap the sales plan sales self finance activity is nothing but a competency development in the entire ecosystem than only developing new technology products how do you make digital manufacturing how do you make digital supply chain management how do you integrate buyer and seller together so that you know you can have a defect free and interruption free supply chain of your customer demand this is what i see in current scenario okay thanks for that uh, mr singh so essentially uh, reliance internally on domestic manufacturing has come to be for uh, manish i want to sort of get you in here uh, everybody spoke about the supply chain of the future and you're the technology person here so tell me the supply chain of the future how does it really look like and across the industries and sector the new buzz what is gamification in the fintech blockchain everything so can supply chain really be a solution which can be gamified and is oracle really thinking about something like that yes uh, and thanks for asking me this question i will i will uh, take a step back and uh, possibly touch upon what mr rathi and mr singh said and i will give you a couple of examples of my existing customers i have a customer who is into commodity trading so rice uh, coffee sugar beans uh, our daily consumer products now uh, this uh, 50 billion dollar organization let's say uh, manufactures the coffee beans in one continent they ship it to another continent for processing eventually all those processed beans are sent into the third continent for labeling cleaning and packaging and eventually distributed globally now imagine the kind of difficulties these organizations faced when you had container shortages when you had the suez canal fiasco and the goods were ready to be distributed but were not been able to do because of which uh, the shell life of those products eventually there was a loss of 10 to 12 percent now these were unseen uh, uh, situations for us ever in the past and organizations that i'm talking about then found ways to try and uh, uh, just to allude to what mr singh is saying uh, uh, produce locally consume locally rather than thinking of the whole picture because they wanted to avoid costs Coming to this interesting point, and uh, nowadays a lot of people ask me whenever I meet my prospective customers mm -hmm. about uh, gamification. So just uh, since we have an eminent panel on the steel industry, I will take a pause, which I mentioned uh, to in the beginning of the conversation. Uh, I was having a conversation with the, one of the top five uh, steel industries glo globally, and I was mm -hmm. surprised in the first call when the CIO uh, said, Manish, uh can you amazon my business and i thought uh, it was a steel is a classic brick and mortar industry you know there are a lot of furnaces there is a lot of movement there are a lot of blue collar workers who are working really hard and here is a gentleman who's asking me to amazon the business on on understanding or interacting with him more what he meant was that Today, I don't want to be seen as an industry which works at the back end, but I really want to then popularize my products and sell the products, which means a arsenal metal steel can be purchased anywhere, 
delivered anywhere and eventually if it needs some uh, customer feedback it can be taken from somewhere else uh, i can see mr sharma smiling already <laughs> listening to you <laughs> and and i i, I they, pro, uh, honestly mr sharma i was not prepared for this so i went back i did my homework and came to the customer again saying that sir this is uh, this is i thought i was coming up with i will save you this much of uh, logistics cost and i will try and get you the inward movement from australia in terms of the iron ore at the earliest give me opportunity and here you are asking me to amazon your business so be that as may all i'm saying is all of us are learning on the job if you will again this gamification finally what is gamification is that you have more and more millennials coming into your workforce they are done and they are done with doing old traditional ways they will not be any more interested to do that they want to see how are they performing against all the competition if there is a leaderboard how are they delivering on their kpi matrix actually can supply chain be made more interesting and that is what the word srija that gamification lot of customers are talking about i encourage this eminent panel to uh, really think about this in besides your day to day activity as to how can you uh, get this element of uh, gamification in your total businesses thanks thanks for that manish mr sharma you have anything to add to what manish just said gamification of a business yeah. Steel yeah thank you thank you manish uh, it, yeah thank you very much it was very nice to hear from you actually uh, we are also working on this nowadays and uh, many of our products nowadays it is on portal and we we try to sell through not through amazon by amazon but through system so it is a very good platform definitely we'll be in touch with you uh, as a good thing you told me and uh, no another point i would like to share now we had in the wave 2 we had a big problem because uh, oxygen was in short supply and you know this is a very classical case i'm telling you how we could manage supplying liquid oxygen to various cities in the country when uh, steel industry was asked that uh, we are, by by government of india that you have to uh, give the liquid medical oxygen to to the entire nation so we uh, got get together and uh, uh, there was one nodal officer by ministry of steel and also by ministry of home uh, in delhi who was uh, appointed by government of india he was a is person and you know we we were uh, doing uh, twice a day uh, video conferences and uh, then we started working on this that what are the challenges now because we had in the entire nation uh, about uh, 2400 uh, tankers uh, that was uh, liquid tankers and these tankers are to carry uh, oxygen from eastern part of the country to all the way to north in delhi or in south that is ap telangana chennai or in western part of the country and that was a big challenge so what we did we uh, immediately it was very difficult to uh, uh, to put a vehicle tracker uh, on each and every vehicle so what we did immediately uh, we uh, got into a, a system that each and every mobile phone of each and every driver was linked with the central program and uh, we were watching where the driver is now of course driver must be in the vehicle because that is the they they worked as a as a as a army man at that time and uh, we were watching where the where the truck is at what speed they are running when this particular truck is going to uh, reach to a particular petrol station or diesel station to get the fuel and where can we supply him the the food packet so that he does not stop his truck uh, even for half an hour to take the food then we we could uh, also manage the alternate drivers because all the way from for example uh, from our plant in odisha to delhi it was a 3 days of journey then you know in 3 days one driver sleepless nights cannot have 3 days they, we have to give them rest also so we then found that okay some driver will take over at a distance of 1000 kilometers or 1200 kilometers or 800 kilometers and then this driver will have his telephone and the other driver will be either sleeping or will be taking rest in his, in some of the rest rooms outside and then we'll tracking that that this particular uh, truck will reach at this time uh, to the city we used to talk to the uh, local administration so that they get a green pass no rto hassles all trucks were going uninterrupted without any problem there was no stoppage police was helping them and that was a classical case when the entire country was requiring the liquid oxygen 
This is how the steel industry came forward and supplied liquid oxygen to the entire nation. Finally, after a few days of time, then we were uh, allocated different uh, uh, different uh, cities and different uh, districts and states. Like for example, we were near to Andhra Pradesh. <clears throat> so we were given uh, Andhra Pradesh in Telangana and part of Chennai. Some other companies were given Northern India, some other companies were given Western India and so on. So that was a very, uh, very, very challenging and classical uh, case, I would say case study, I would say, uh, for the logistics and supply chain. Because here it is not only the goods which are at stake, here the human life are at stake. And you can imagine that each uh, city, when we used to drop two ton of liquid oxygen, five ton of liquid, liquid oxygen in a particular hospital, so there was a wave of uh, full joy and that, yes, we could save the people. So that was a very classical experience. We have learned, we have learned how to, uh, uh, how to uh, make it much better in case it is required in future. So now the entire steel industry is ready. On one call, we can deliver much faster and the liquid oxygen in the entire country. And this is what uh, the, the learnings are. So, you know, the technology it plays a very vital role. The spirit it plays a vital role. It was a call, different call. It was like a like a war. And uh, you have to save people. And uh, <clears throat> that was the that was a very good experience, what we learned. And the, we have now made SOPs. We we keep talking to each and every steel industry. Now this new new variant has come, but we are ready. In case the oxygen is required, it will be delivered on time and it will be delivered faster. So that's Thanks why I that. told you it plays a very vital role. Thanks for that, Mr. Sharma. Thanks for sharing the experience which came from your heart. You wanted to really talk about it and it can actually serve as a case study for other logistics companies and how you sort of went about doing this and bringing to the poor and rescue when they continue to the most. Uh, we are the last round of questioning and what a meaningful and insightful conversation we are having. I want to sort of get on to you now, uh, uh, Mr. Sushil Rachi, from my logistics perspective. We spoke about technology, supply chain of the future, uh, inter-global linkages. Uh, Manish sort of spoke about uh, gamification and how to Amazon steel businesses. I want to understand from you, where do you go from here? So much money has been raised by e-commerce unicorns or so many companies, and the buzzword really has been last mile connectivity. So I'm sure this means a lot of business coming your way. Uh, from a logistics perspective, but how are you solving for those challenges at a time when people are talking about uh, that we will deliver stuff to you in an hour, uh, in 15 minutes, you have companies like Instamart and GoFloats and all vying for that customer. What has that intense competition meant for logistics companies? And do you really think you can solve for the last mile connectivity and such short term connectivity by technology? Do you really have the way with all of this now? Thanks uh, for asking this, Srija, because uh, again, we being one of the largest player uh, in India servicing the e-commerce industry, uh, we are very well aware about their aspiration, the challenges uh, which it poses for players like us, and how we are actually solving and giving them uh, almost close to 100% uh, uh, you know, on-time delivery, uh, be it uh, whether it is a one hour delivery, two hour delivery, or any defined time period uh, as per the customer SLA, etc. Now, what goes behind? Uh, one part is technology, the other the, is the also the infrastructure. And in the infrastructure, let me first talk about the infrastructure and then we'll come to the technology. In terms of the infrastructure, what you require is, uh, you, you know, a very good distribution solution and for which you require, uh, you know, warehousing at strategic location, whether it is uh, in the uh, prime cities or the tier two, tier three, tier four cities, a and you need it like a necklace all across the country so that you can service from any point uh, which you can do it. Now today for any customer to do on their own will be clearly impossible because they will not have so many locations uh, available at their disposal. And that is why they have to rely on somebody like us, uh, who is a big logistics player, to support them in their uh, initiatives. Today, we have almost like 20 million uh, square feet of warehousing spread uh, over 200 locations. So for us, it becomes much easier to offer a solution to our customer, 
where the distribution can happen in a very very effective cost effective and a time effective uh, manner that having said also has changed further with the investment in automation and technology so for example for e commerce you require very uh, big sort centers uh, which will help in terms of sorting and uh, pin code wise and then distributing into those thing and for that you require a lot of investment in the automation because when you deal with 4 lakh pieces 5 lakh pieces on a daily basis you can't just do it manually you require a lot of automation in your warehouses in your supply chain etc to you know support that initiative and the third piece of course is the technology and here e-commerce player themselves are making a lot of investment in the technology and players like us are supporting by collaborating with them into that technology initiative to ensure that the complete track and trace is available for each and every uh, product which is moving through the supply chain whether it is moving from one city to other whether it is moving within the city and how the time stamp is taken uh, by you know doing the delivery at the right time to customer etc is a completely seamless experience so today another important aspect is the integration of the technology pieces between the customer and the uh, you know the logistic service provider earlier people were having partly their own system and partly they were relying on somebody else's system in today's world to solve for the uh, you know the last mile challenge and to give that seamless experience to your end customer it is very very important that both the technologies are integrated so that they can talk to each other and the information flow can happen in a very seamless manner we have also thought about you know different solution because as you were probably trying to indicate the challenges in the um, uh, you know last mile is also alternate modes so for example we have launched edel which is our electric delivery vehicle you know battery operated vehicle that is solving for another problem which is the sustainability so it's a solution from a long term perspective i think indian government also wants to move a whole hog in that particular direction they want to have a lot of electric vehicle so while the passenger vehicle movement had already started now we are uh, seeing a change in the delivery on the delivery side also electric vehicles are being adopted so our uh, edel uh, delivery is uh, helping e-commerce and consumer goods for now uh, in a big way the third thing is again as i said looking at the uh, how apart from the infrastructure and technology the whole process so um, uh, you know mr singh will uh, understand this because in automotive industry a milk run concept is very very popular on the front side so when the supplies are coming to the plant etc you do a lot of milk run for the uh, last mile we have done the reverse milk run concept where you uh, you know take from the uh, warehouse and uh, drop at multiple uh, customer location etc so that is what the concept we have utilized to again uh, optimize as well as make it very very effective that Mr. Rathi, thank you for putting it out for us. And good sort of you mentioned sustainability, and that is my next question for you, uh, Mr. Sharma and Mr. Singh. Really, sustainability, which would form a very important part of your organization, and how you are thinking about it. I'll, I'll begin with you, Mr. Sharma, really on this entire effort on going net carbon zero, and we really have to be that India wants to be a five trillion economy very soon, sustainability is the way to go. This entire narrative of going green, what has that really meant, meant for the culture of innovation in your organization? How are you thinking about that, going green? Yeah, it's a very uh, challenging subject. We have already uh, worked on this. We started working on this particular uh, uh, subject about eight years back. So uh, the steel industry uh, use a lot of uh, coal. So we started converting coal into gas that is called synthesis gas. And then synthesis gas to produce uh, 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 directly reduced iron. And finally, it goes to the electric arc furnaces to produce steel. So you know, this particular route is 50% uh, 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 CO2, uh, CO2, uh, I would say economic uh, in terms of uh, producing steel through the blast furnaces versus producing steel through uh, the coal to gas and gas to DRI and DRI to electric arc furnaces. 
like for example uh, the steel industry in general through electro blast furnace routes they produce about 2.6 ton of co2 per ton of steel making but here we are producing steel through this particular route at 1.35 tons of co2 per ton of steel making it is nearly half or i would say 45% or 48% so uh, this particular uh, technology uh, first time we uh, brought into the country and uh, first time in the world the gasification technology and the syn gas from coal is being used in the world in india and that is jspl in general steel and power so this uh, particular uh, lead we have already taken now government of india after having seen all the benefits government of india has uh, uh, presented a, uh, has decided not presented has decided to convert at least 100 million ton of coal uh, from next year onwards to convert into gas so that coal to gas gas to fertilizer coal to gas gas to power gas to steel gas to liquid fuel like uh, diesel or petrol benzene naphtha can be produced and even the plastics can be produced from coal so you know uh, burning coal directly into the furnaces or burning coal in the boilers to produce electricity is not a right uh, uh, right uh, method what we have to do we have to convert coal into gas either through the underground coal gasification or uh, uh, above the ground coal gasification in a very very closed atmosphere and then finally this gas is to be used either for the cooking gas for the domestic use or for the uh, gas for the fuel furnaces or to produce power and or to produce petrol diesel whatever we want to do so god has given us more than 350 billion ton of coal today we use only 1 billion ton coal from india we import about 250 million ton coal from outside so 1 billion ton coal means 350 years of coal we have so if you don't use this coal now then we can never use this coal honorable prime minister has uh, spoken very well during g20 summit where he is told that the whole world has used the coal our coal consumption had been very low and our domestic environment in terms of per capita is the least in the top 10 countries so now uh, it does not mean that we want to damage the climate uh, uh, and we 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 should damage no we should not we should try to utilize this coal which is gifted by by god it is bestowed by god to us we can stop importing crude we can stop importing any kind of plastic we can stop importing fertilizers tomorrow i mean if the right fully we use the technology coal to gas and then gas to uh, uh, this particular these particular products so this is what we have done and now we are uh, uh, moving ahead to produce coal to methanol coal to ethanol and we also started working on coal to liquid that is coal to diesel and coal to petrol but unfortunately the mines were cancelled at that time by honorable supreme court so we couldn't proceed but now uh, government of india has a very positive outlook towards the industry and government of india is also interested in cutting down their uh, their fuel budget import budget and if government of india takes uh, uh, these uh, steps converting coal to Uh, uh, coal to coal to liquid, coal to HSD, coal to fertilizer, coal to power. There is no point transporting coal from coal mines to J and K or Rajasthan or to down south south in Tamil Nadu. We should transport power. The power plants should be installed near to the coal mines, and these power plants should not be based on the burning coal into the furnaces, but converting coal into gas and utilizing gas to produce power. which gives more than 24% of additional efficiency and this is what we are working on thanks for that mr sharma any other business leader would have said that oh we are working towards this and all but you bring out real insight that you know we have coal we have to use it and how you're solving the purposes so it is no point green washing it a lot of business leaders the risk of making them sound green on the green washing is also happening i just hope that this does not necessarily continue india can actually <laughs> to the problem that we have and we also heard our prime minister uh, at the recent summit and how he has made some very strong concerns about that uh, i want to sort of come to you mr singh on your sort of concluding remarks on the culture of innovation and perhaps how the sustainability and green as an energy can really feed the yeah. oem and oem thinking about oh, and we will sort of get on to the niche and understand from him Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Akita, for asking this uh, very important and most powerful question, which is the key and um, discovery of pandemic for India. Okay, other than self-reliance. So definitely, we have been always technology follower 
as a country in many of the sectors and depending upon the European countries, America, Japan, and etc. So due to supply chain restrictions, due to many, many problems, we realized that Atnivar Bharat is the utmost necessary things. So when it comes to sustainability and culture of innovation, as the Uno Minda Group being a progressive company and looking forward in supporting to the country a movement of self-reliance, I think we are working from last almost two decades in this sector and we have a lot of products offering to the Indian market, more than 20 products. And in pandemic time, we discovered more, more, many, many products diversification due to electric vehicle trends and autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles trend. So the culture of innovation, we have a set of standard operating procedure, which starts from market research to the consumer research to the you know, the troubles in the market, the product qualities, who's the warranties, many, many things are considered together. And then we have the filtrations of those, you know, issues. And we generate a lot of ideas, connect to the universities, to the, you know, the lot of innovations happening around us and focusing on the need of the hour. For example, electric vehicle. Is the push uh, coming due to the global warming due to the fuel uh, challenges so the electric vehicle is driving the innovation safety is driving the innovation the quality in the cost is driving primarily india has been the cost innovation country followed by you know the second uh, you know first is china and then we have been number two so the cost innovation is you know earlier was the most pri you know important priority so coming to the main questions about the contribution from our side, or I would say from the automotive tier one side, that electrification has demanded a lot of innovations. And in recent last two, three years, the movement has really accelerated. So the low power products using more semiconductors than the mechanical products, focusing on the light weighting, reducing the weight of the part, you know, so that you can reduce the weight of overall vehicle to drive you need lesser energy so the light weighting is another you know the innovation contributing for the you know the less power consumptions so this this is one of the area where you know actually we are contributing as a product as far as the factory is concerned of course solar power the infrared infrared based products not uh, you know the electricity electricity and thermal kind of processes applications more on the you know the new new technology manufacturing processes then we use heater and electrifications and the gases to produce you know the more heat so we are reducing it uh, at a larger extent most innovative manufacturing process is being used to reduce the carbon footprint as far as the manufacturing process is concerned so these are the two Thanks. elements from the supply and manufacturing point of view Thanks for that. Uh, we heard from all our business leaders on the culture of innovation in the organization, all the thing about sustainability. We began the conversation with challenges, the roadblocks that came their way, how they converted those challenges into opportunities. What does the new normal look like? How they have really utilized the COVID-19 pandemic into unprecedented growth revenue years for them. How are they thinking about building supply chain of the future? And this entire conversation, all of them also laid out that how important the green sustainability piece is to them. Manish, you gave some interesting aspects on your conversations with industry stakeholders and gamification, supply chain of the future. And you also mentioned very, something very interesting on how to Amazonify the business, where every business wants to become the next Amazon, and so rightly so. It's the world's largest company. And one of the things about Amazon really is that their customer obsession. And the second thing is very long term. They really call them long term. And long term meaning thinking about 100 years, 200 years, really like that. I want to understand from you when. You hear from a lot of organizations, the new goal of them is to, uh, is to really become an Amazon or to Amazonify them. What really are you talking about and how you sort of think about that and how can companies really get there? Thanks again. And uh, uh, we are a bit over time, so I will not prolong this. However, respecting the time of the senior executives on this call, all I'm saying is that uh, innovation is a new constant. 
things which we do today uh, will be non existent day after tomorrow and things which we didn't even comprehend to uh, uh, comprehend today will be the new norm in a week's time so uh, uh, all organizations irrespective of how the customers that they service or indeed the product that the products that they bring in the market need to be agile uh, oracle is no different uh, uh, what we are trying to do subtly different than possibly everybody else in the market is that we have kept the main building blocks of our, of our supply chain solutions limited and we are trying to get more enhancement as a part of the same solution so uh, gone are the days when you will see more and more products coming from oracle in the addressing the innovation piece if you will but more and more enhancements coming as the part of the same product the uh, 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 to be honest with you uh, the innovations for oracle has been more internal than external today the entire organization works on a cloud platform which we uh, try and evangelize it to our customer so that is the new norm uh, whether it is a uh, uh, fmcg industry whether it is a brick and mortar industry automotive industry or for that matter pharma industry oracle is working absolutely hard in terms of trying to get more and more innovations of uh, in our solutions thereby making the life of all of us easy that at a click of a button or a click of a mouse the product that you want the or the uh, uh, or the uh, uh, services that you need are available without worrying about the back end technologies that we invest in uh, there is lot more to speak about innovation and uh, i will be uh, more than happy to do it in the subsequent meetings all i am reassuring the eminent uh, and uh, uh, senior jury is that uh, this is the only way that we will go forward collaborate innovate and uh, be always there for each other thanks reja thanks for that manish collaborate innovate and always be there for each other i think you pretty nicely summed up this conversation but before we go off i send to some rapid fire and a quick fun segment so I'll ask you a question and your answers have to be maximum one word or one sentence you can't go more than that uh so yeah i'll begin with you manish a uh, technology guy to let's start with you for the for for fun this time what do you think of the current unicorn obsession uh you said one word right <laughs> uh yeah. exciting <laughs> no you can't say just exciting <laughs> which is the most overhyped unicorn according to you let me simplify okay. the question okay uh, okay which is the most overhyped unicorn according to me uh uh bnb <laughs> okay uh i come to you now airbnb airbnb okay. okay airbnb okay mr sharma i want to ask you when you when you see companies loss making companies becoming unicorns and all these years you are running this steel company where path to profitability is so important what is that first thing that comes to your mind working together collaboration that okay. plays a very vital role in life okay uh, sushil I, i want to ask you a question you are in logistics industry of so many e-commerce companies what should you think is the future who can be the next amazon what is the future of e-commerce according to you i would say uh, uh, the uh, i i mean if you're asking me Uh, who can be the next one uh, then it's a uh, you know very different question but i wish it is minor logistics <laughs> okay uh, now the last question to you uh, mr singh uh, and one advice if you would have for the government of india in terms of uh, self reliance and atmanirbharta what would that be in one sentence i would say that uh, government of india should uh, invite the young mind those who have uh, struggled in the industry in last 10 year while facing this disruptive technological challenge and because they have got good exposure than the old mindset i'm sorry to mention about that but you need to invite young mindset in government of india panel to really make them understand the need of the future Okay. If I think if we had more time, that, I would have. This is my best advice. 
I would have also spent some more time talking to Mr. Sharma and all of you, uh, Manish and Sheel and everyone. I'm talking about manufacturing unicorns. Why don't we see manufacturing unicorns coming from India? So many other unicorns. But it was a great discussion. Thank you so much for your time and energy. We had a very meaningful discussion, a wide-ranging one, where all of you were very candid in bringing out some real insights and on-the-ground examples. Thank you. This time I see you next. Goodbye and good luck. <laughs>